All right, many of you are frequent patrons, customers, few new faces. Welcome to everyone. Um, this is our second visit, although actually the first visit to this library by today's colonial housewife. I wasn't there for that, but it got great reviews. So we invited her back and we're so happy to have her here. And I'll just tell you, oh, by the way, I want to say that, hmm. that Belia and her daughter, Eris, were flown here <laughs> by Sally. Where's Sally? Cousin Sally. Yeah. Cousin, who's a pilot? Oh my gosh. Oh, no. <laughs> and so we're glad they made it. No, uh, oh, we knew they would just make it. It's much safer driving. We knew they would make it. I'm flying. <laughs> anyway, uh, Belia lives uh, her life by the adage, there is no growth without change. She is a teacher, an author, a former Brazilian dairy farm owner, for another day maybe, <laughs> and an expert on New England's colonial women. Moving into a 1770 farm, Connecticut farmhouse ignited her obsession, interest, obsessive interest with the colonial era and led her to her first presentation. Uh, Velia and her daughter Eris, which Eris is there, back there with Sally, um, present at venues throughout the Northeast and teach a variety of herbal and historical workshops. Who Eats What? Elliot's first book uh, is a hands-on science series for children and it was inspired by How Cool Is That? Her hands-on science classes. Delia has been married for 35 years and is the mother of two grown children. She has too many rescue dogs and cats according to herself. Is happy as with a fresh stack of library books. She loves thrift shops and is passionate about alternative medicine. We are so happy to have her here. Please welcome Valian. Yeah, so thanks to Sally, our three hour drive is actually what, a 22 minute flight? So that's pretty cool, yes. So my name is Vilia. This is my daughter, Eris. I just want to make sure you all have a good sense of humor. Yes? Yes. Okay. Here's why I'm starting to say this before I even do my talks. Eris and I were invited to speak at some college in New York, New York, I forget where it was, and we assumed we were going to speak to American Studies majors or Women's Studies majors. So it turns out we got to the college and they were all business majors, <laughs> finance majors, and 75% of the audience were 19-year-old boys wearing hoodies. Okay, so I started speaking, they put their phones away, which that was pretty cool, but then when I got to the word menstruation for the first time, the hoodies went up, and when I got to the word condom, they started tying the things closed. By the time I got to, I don't even know what, they were kind of like slithering under their chairs, because I don't know what they thought this talk was going to be about, but you guys are all cool with everything? Okay, good. So I like a lot of feedback, so the more you laugh, the more you grimace, the better I do. Okay, you know? All right, good. So, my, say, my name is Billy, this is Eris. I kind of have to give you our backstory to explain how this all came to be. So in 2010, some pretty crummy stuff happened to us as a family, and we no longer had any hopes or dreams or goals or money, but we needed a place to heal. So we found this foreclosed farmhouse in Woodbury, Connecticut. It had been vacant for five years. It was in foreclosure. We knew nothing about it, except we thought maybe it was built in about 1850. And actually, frankly, we didn't care because we just wanted a place to live. So we made a joke offer to the bank, never in a million years did we think they'd accept our offer, but they did. And we moved into the winter of 2011, which remember was that really, 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 really bad winter. So what happened was in the five, five years the house was vacant, they were sending property maintenance guys over to take care of the snow and take care of the grass. And I guess just before we moved in, there was a bunch of ice up on the roof. Remember that was the, the year with the ice? So they sent over a couple of dopes who went up on the roof with axes and hatchets, and they wound up making a hole in the roof, unbeknownst to us. So by the time we moved in, our kitchen ceiling sheetrock was soaking wet. And when my husband Jim pulled it down, we discovered these original hand-hewn log beams. So we were like, holy smoke, this is an old house, because we had no idea. So the very next day, I raced off to Woodbury Town Hall. I spent the entire day there, traced the deed back to 1770, signed by King George III, Colony of Connecticut. And I didn't realize it at the time, but now in retrospect, I know that's when my healing started. The next thing that happened was, in our kitchen we had this old wood stove, like not really old, maybe 1940s, 1950s, 
And the six months we lived in the house, I just always had a feeling there was something cool behind the wood stove and it just kind of gnawed away at me. So one night at dinner, I mentioned to everybody, and within five minutes, Jim went down to the basement and he came back upstairs with pry bars and sledgehammers. And I always say, I took these pictures with my junky, crummy camera. The whole time the kids were like, Mommy, we you chill with the camera? Um, but I'm so glad I took them. I thought they were just for us. Never in a million years did what I ever have thought that we figured out now about 35,000 people have seen these photos. <laughs> the next day, Jim came home with a jackhammer, which really didn't work very well. We went back to the regular hammers. And this is the worst photo ever <laughs> taken of us. <laughs> Eris and I include this in just about everything that we do because we have a lot of events at our house and people come over now, they see everything all spiffed up and they don't realize the three tons of cement and brick and field stones the four of us lugged out of the house. And the even funnier uh, story about this picture is that Eris and I just wrote a mother-daughter memoir that's going to be released on Mother's Day and we're working with this agent in Los Angeles and somehow she wound up seeing this photo and she said to Eris, Eris, your father is so handsome, he should be a movie star. And we're like, he is, in real life, he is a really handsome guy, but I mean, like, not there, he looks pretty good. So, our hard work paid off, because this is what was behind there, just like that. And then around the corner, there was another solid sheetrock wall, and Eris and Jim pretty much did this one by themselves. And this is how it all looks today. And then we've gone on to, what comes next, the floors? Of it? Oh, we part of all our flooring, and we have all Kingswood flooring in the upstairs and a lot of the downstairs of our house. We've had two paranormal investigations where they really have found documented audio and visual stuff. So all of this led to my obsession with colonial women and my colonial good wife talk. And then audience, audience that wanted more, so we came up with the not so golden life of the Gilded Age wife. So moving to that talk. So I believe age eight is an important age developmentally for a child. I think that what you're exposed to at age eight is kind of really gonna be your, mm, your kind of interest in life. So my point is, age eight was the first time I ever went to Newport with my parents, and I just became obsessed with the era. Not like I was envious, I just, just the wealth of it all just kind of astounded me. So you would agree, Eris, obsessed with it, right? So obsessed that for our 25th wedding anniversary, Jim gave me a set of Boats for Women China, so are you guys all familiar with Alva Vanderbilt Belmont? Yes. Oh, yeah, right, right. So she, of course, was a so, uh, socialite, went on to become a suffragette. She owned Marble House, and on the grounds of Marble House, she had the, the Chinese tea house, where she held a lot of suffragette rallies. So my obsession is for real. So just to set the stage, the time-wise, the stage for the era. So the Victorian era lasts from 1837 to 1901. The Gilded Age falls in between, inside of there, goes from 1870 to 1900. So from the election of Ulysses S. Grant to the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt. So Mark Twain was the one who coined the term Gilded Age. And I'm sure you all know something is gilded, it just has a very fine layer of, of golden paint on it. So the period was glittering on the surface, but it was corrupt underneath. And as Charles Dickens would have said, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. So the Americans who achieved great wealth flaunted it. Like for instance, one of the most outrageous examples, there was a woman named Mamie Stuyvesant Fish, and she held a dinner party to honor her dog, who arrived sporting a $15,000 diamond dog collar, which would be about $390,000 in today's money. So while Mrs. Fish's spoiled dog wear diamonds, many Americans were wearing rags. So in 1890, the average annual income was $380, which is approximately $9,000 in today's money, which of course is below the poverty level, and the average day's earning was 60 cents. In the Manhattan population, these figures just blew my mind. In 1780, the Manhattan population was 25,000. By 1848, it jumped to 500,000, so that's a huge jump. So the urban poor and most immigrants lived in tenement housing, and I love this quotation that we found. If the skyscraper was the jewel of the American city, the tenement was its oil. So pigs roamed through New York's neighborhoods eating garbage. In the 1870s, the number of homeless children just in New York City fluctuated between 20 and 30,000. And because of the massive overcrowding, cholera and yellow fever just spread through the tenements. And it's been said that the 19th century was one of the dirtiest, filthiest times in all of history because everybody burned wood or coal or just a very, very dirty time. So there was no sewage treatment. These numbers just blew my mind also. In 1870, thousands of tons of fecal matter dumped into the Hudson River every day, and it was no different with the Thames. But as all this was going on, 
wealthy women were making social calls and they had these strict, ridiculous rules about their calling cards. I have to read this to you, it's kind of funny. So a lady's card is larger than a gentleman's. The former may be glazed, the latter not. A young lady does not require a separate card so long as she is living with her mother. The card should be delivered in person and not sent by post. A lady should desire her manservant to inquire if the mistress of the house at which she is calling is at home. If not at home, she should hand him three cards, one of her own and two of her husband's. If the answer is in the affirmative, she should, after making the call, leave two of her husband's cards on the hall table and neither put them in the card basket nor leave them on the drawing room table, um, nor offer them to her hostess, all of which would be very incorrect. When the mistress of the house has a grown-up daughter or daughters, the lady leaving card should turn down one corner of her visiting card, the right-hand corner generally, to include the daughter in the call. Now these are like ridiculous rules, don't you think? <laughs> so it was an age of invention. From 1790 to 1870, the U.S. Patent Office granted 40,000 patents, but from 1870 to 1900, there were 400,000 patents granted. There are new types of farm machinery being invented. Um, for example, before 1881, not one, not no wheat of all at all was grown in the Dakota Territory, but six years later, we were producing 62 million bushels. So six years later, in 1870, the American Steel Industry didn't exist. Um, six years later, no, 30 years later, we were producing more than 10 million tons of steel annually, more than the whole rest of the world combined. But, as all this was going on, people were still pooping in outhouses and chamber pots, and it wasn't until after World War I that we saw the invention or the, the wider spread use of the, of the flush toilet. In 1857, only one quarter of New York City had access to sewer lines, and there was one, one place in New York where uh, 41 families used an outdoor outhouse. 41 families, one outhouse. So wealthier people placed their chamber pots in something called a clothes stool. And a clothes stool is exactly what it, what it sounded like. So the chamber pot would go in there. Then what eventually happened was they put these clothes stools inside of closets where they were hanging their best dresses because they believed the stuff brewing in the chamber pot would kill the vermin that was in these beautiful dresses that they had. So this is why all these, this calling dress stuff's going on. I know. So, <laughs> so although Gilded Age women in the upper and lower class had many differences, there was one similarity. Women were viewed as second best to men, and they were supposed to be content with this role in society. So an overriding belief of the era was that Sweetness is to woman what sugar is to fruit. It is her first business to be happy, a sunbeam in the house, making others happy. True, she will often have a tear in her eye, but like the bride of young Lochinvar, it must be accompanied with a smile on her lips. It is not every woman who remembers that her raison d'etre is to give out pleasure to all, as a fire gives out heat. Now, when I found this quotation, Eris, what did you say? Bless. Bless, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of blessing through this talk, you'll see. So men, for the most part, were clueless, and they believed a woman's body controlled her mind. So men spent an absurd amount of time worrying about the obstruction of a woman's menstrual flow because they believed the blood would then be forced to her brain and lead to a psychological breakdown. <laughs> this part I have to read because I, I so screwed up in their thinking. She would become a flooody woman, possibly with a wandering womb, and if there wasn't a baby in your uterus or the male member in your vagina, that your, that your womb was prone to just wander around your body. Like they actually believed it could be here one day, it could be here one day, for real is what they actually believed. Oh so obviously, doctors are woefully misinformed. I like this one. This curved tube of the vagina possesses some curious powers which are in action only during connection with the male. So what your vagina was doing the rest of the time, I have no idea. <laughs> Megan's kind of dying back there. <laughs> so welcome to America's Gilded Age. So if you take nothing else from this presentation, the overriding belief of the day was that nature abhors, oh, I'm oh, sorry, sorry, Fred said, remember we had menstruation hygiene, very good, was that nature abhors an empty womb. So Dr. Dr. John Burns, in his Principles of Midwifery, he wrote that menstruation is to be considered as a disease, not only a disease, but a dangerous one, which if not controlled properly, could lead to madness, and controlling it meant sedation. That's I dealt with it. So Dr. John Burns remembered, recommended these following things to do during a woman's monthly um, monthlies. So apply cold water, well, generally locally. For five days, the patient must be kept at rest in a horizontal posture. <laughs> 
Opiates are to be given if there is much pain and irritation. Food ought to be sparing and anything warm is to be avoided. Liberal dose of opium and bowels kept open by laxatives. Okay. So when I read this, I wondered, well, what about working and poor women? Because obviously dairy maids, housemaids, fish workers, and oyster sellers, they had physical jobs. They couldn't be on their feet. They couldn't be lying around in bed for five, for five days every month. So people always wonder, what did women then do when they had their period? So the most common thing was actually, but they were still doing during the colonial era, they would take um, lard, or yeah, lard or tallow, they would smear it on their thighs to keep the moisture away, then they would take a hunk of sheepskin, they would cut it to the right size, they'd put their fur side up against their crotch, just kind of tuck it in place there, and just kind of go about their day, then they'd boil these things and reuse them over and over again. Um, they also made crocheted sanitary napkins. So I say if you belong to a knitting club or a crochet club, it could be a nice little club project there. In the colonial era, a clout was actually a diaper, but by this time, a clout, and I could not find a photo of one anywhere I looked, it was actually a little cloth triangle with attached strings they tied around their thighs and their waist. I couldn't find one no matter what I did. And they made homemade pads that kind of folded like a hand towel. And FYI, the safety pin was invented in the 1840s, so that's how they, they started putting it in there. But many women, especially rural women and pioneer women, they used nothing. And what they would do, they were practicing something then called free bleeding, which is exactly what it sounds like. And historians have researched women's diaries, like women who went across the prairie. They re researched any letters they sent back home. And they couldn't find any evidence of any women suggesting different menstrual products to bring with them. So you know all those little house in the prairie girls? They were probably bleeding all over the place. And this is one doctor's opinion on the matter. He says, completely disgusting to bleed into your chemise and wearing that same chemise for four to eight days can cause infection. So as a tampon user, I wonder were there tampons during this era? What do you think? There were, they don't sound too pleasant, and I'm the kind of person, I kind of love visual images, so I think the last sentence of this description is the one that cracks me up the most. I just picture this poor woman, like with yourselves. Isn't the best sentence, the last sentence the best? Oh, God. Or the worst, depending on how you look at it. So not all, but most Gilded Age men were literate and they had access to books. And not all, but most women were not literate and they had no access to books. So there was no advertising for women about women's bodies. And before the 19th century, doctors didn't even realize that um, ovulation was, was linked to pregnancy. And they still thought that sperm was created in the spinal cord. So they thought women needed to bleed to cool their emotional, hysterical natures. So women were self-conscious during their periods, and they took great steps to avoid detection. So they carried around nutmegs, nosegays, and tussy mussies to conceal odors, which was good because female reproductive fluids had corrosive powers transmittable through smell. I actually believe this. I think my favorite talk of the whole part of the, is this one. So in the mid-1800s, male doctors discovered that women had been menstruating incorrectly. <laughs> male doctors, yes. So they warned that menstruation begun too early in life was detrimental and that she who develops early fades early with a feeble middle life. Yeah, no. So what brought, about, what brought about early menstruation or monthly unwellness? It could be a whole bunch of different things. So it could be something like attending the theater, <laughs> having a childhood crush, music, reading, late hours, children's parties, love stories, anything that stimulates the emotions. So this is in 1880, advice to a woman on the management of her own health. I like this quotation. And like, how the heck do you trifle with your period? I have no idea what that even means. <laughs> So I also believe that many of the regularities of menstruation are often cured by marriage, of course. And they were nature's sign to a woman that she is not leading a normal life. So if you didn't get married, you pretty much were doomed. So moving on to hysteria. So anything, if it happened to a woman, could be diagnosed as hysteria. It could be epilepsy, diabetic shock, neural disorders, PTSD, postpartum, depression, and bipolar disorder. And as you can imagine, some of the most hysterical women were menopausal ones. So in ancient times, it was believed that postmenopausal women were actually the wisest women because they retained their wise blood. 
And an ancient symbol of this is the red carpet. So this is something that was walked on by kings and queens and heroes and brides, and it was called the royal road. So it wasn't until the 18th century that menopause was seen, or up until the 18th century, menopause was seen as a natural phenomenon. But over the next 300 years, it began to be viewed as something that was like a disease, leading to bizarre surgeries and all kinds of treatments. Like, for instance, in 1855, there was a guy named Dr. Edward Tilt, and he prescribed his usual mixture before bedtime of carbonated soda and opium, a large belladonna, which as we all know is deadly nightshade, uh, poultice placed on the stomach, and here's the really bad one, vaginal injections with a, with a solution of acetate of lead oh. in your vagina, yes. Sigmund Freud, our old, our old buddy, he described menopausal women as quarrelsome, and he recommended the liberal use of drugs, namely sedatives, to keep, to keep them calm and controlled. Next up came a guy named a Scottish surgeon, who was also a laudanomatic, named John Lazars, and he believed in cutting the body to cure the mind. So he figured if a woman's ovaries weren't working, just cut them out. So um, Lazars performed 200 ovariotomies, and he killed 89 women in the process. Then came Baker Brown, an English gynecologist and surgeon. He decided to take the ovariotomy a few inches further, and he started um, experimenting with clitoridectomies as a cure for epilepsy. And of course, epilepsy was of course caused by masturbation, which is that, that was the old masturbation days. So moving on to the wedding night. So apparently, from what I was reading, a cloistered 83-year-old nun would know more about sex and penises than a Gilded Age bride on her wedding night. <laughs> So it's been said that women counsel their daughters, when your husband seeks to force his attentions on you, just close your eyes and think of England. <laughs> so when it came to a woman's wedding night, forget about any of the romantic stuff like Heath, Cliff, and Wuthering Heights, it was nothing like that, because brides were told they were supposed to lie on their back with their legs stretched out straight the entire time, and only very enlightened men bothered with foreplay. So it was, sex was pretty much a horrible experience for most of these women, and it was, you know, that's, the, the stories that we hear really are true. So um, if a bride did manage to read anything about her wedding night, this is the kind of thing that she would have seen in a book. So just read that to yourself. Picture yourself a poor 19-year-old girl. Would you have any idea what was going to happen to you if you read this description? Like, so I think that probably the general thought of the time, if you read the description, was... <laughs> But they had very clear, clear rules about when you shouldn't have sex. Like, for instance, you shouldn't have sex after a large meal, or you might have a cerebral hemorrhage or a stroke. While either participant is drunk, or you might create an idiot offspring. After, it's okay to laugh. <laughs> after great physical or mental exertion, because you could wind up blind, insane, or drunk. I mean, dead, I'm sorry. And don't do it often. They say you should only indulge once a month, because that kind of heightens the, the excitement of it all. And don't do it when thinking important thoughts, because when a man's thoughts wander, his offspring will be feeble. So. That's a good laughing section over here. <laughs> so what we want to pregnancy and childbirth. So there were, as you imagine, there were no pregnancy tests, so women had to be on the lookout for signs of pregnancy. So the first one was ceasing to be unwell, which is a, that's what it means, ceasing to menstruate, morning sickness, painful and enlarged breaths, and quickening at the 19th week. So no woman could be absolutely certain she was pregnant until about the fifth month when the baby started to move. And they believed pregnancy was a condition to be concealed as long as possible, and any books, any chapters and books that dealt with pregnancy, those chapters were called in retirement. That's funny. <laughs> So at this point, experienced midwives were kind of being squeezed out of the whole childbirth process because doctors liked attending childbirth because they, they, could, they could then forge a long, you know, everlasting attachment with the family. Another reason was the increasing use of chloroform. So it began to be used in 1847 and it gained popularity in 1857 when it was given to Queen Victoria, but it wasn't wildly popular until the 1870s. So women clamored for it, but doctors were deeply resistant to give it to women, not because they feared it or had any, had any worries about it, but because of this passage from the Bible, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. So not all male doctors felt this way. Charles Darwin and the botanist Joseph Hooker, they were there when their wives had birth, I mean gave birth, and they were the ones that actually administered the chloroform. So after giving birth, upper class women, they were kept flat on their backs for a month and fed through a feeding cup. So the windows were kept closed, 
They had uh, sandbags along the window so to keep any drafts out. A kerosene lamp burned light and night and day. They were fed an invalid, invalid diet, diet. They nursed the entire time. So after a month, they kind of emerged kind of uh, in very bad shape. So childbed fever, which actually, you know, septicemia, was the most common cause of death in childbirth. And there was no cure. Doctors prescribed opium, champagne, and brandy and soda to ease the passing. By the time they reached age five, 35 out of 45 children had either had smallpox, measles, scarlet fever, diphtheria, whooping cough, typhus, enteric fever, or a combination of all of the above. And the cures were often what killed children. Like for instance, women or mothers weren't allowed to use thermometers because they thought they weren't skilled enough to use thermometers. And back then, a, uh, what do you think? a water bottle was actually a crock with a cork stopper. So very often, if they put these things in bed with children, in a crib with children, they would, the kids would wriggle around and, and kick, and very often these things sloshed out, and kids were scalded to death by the scalding water that was in there. So meals for girls were supposed to be plain, because giving girls strong-tasting food aroused thoughts of passion, which led to early menstruation, which lead to a feeble middle life. So if you ate chili or tacos, you pretty much were a goner. You just kind of hang it up. <laughs> now, moving on to, well, not moving on. This sounds like a little abrupt transition here. But we're going to talk about 1700s for a second. You know, you're all familiar with Casanova, the Latin lover. So he was among the first to use condoms to prevent pregnancy. Um, he called the condom an English riding coat. So condoms, they actually were called skins or safes. They were originally made from animal intestines, and they were used to protect men from venereal diseases from prostitutes. So in 1844, Charles Goodyear uh, discovered the vulcanization of rubber, and all that means is making rubber more elastic, and soon rubber condoms were mass-produced, and they were made to be used once and thrown away. So early condoms were washed, they were smeared with petroleum jelly, then they put them in a special box, and they used them over and over again. So rubber condoms could be weak in spots, and they had seams running down the center and they were very thick, but still they were better than nothing. Because conceiving a child out of wedlock turned a woman into a pariah. In the 1800s, unmarried pregnant girls were in deep trouble, and a woman's virtue was ruined if she had sex outside of marriage. And really only recently has that, that thinking kind of changed. So women who became pregnant, they were ostracized, and no pregnant woman could, be, could work as a maid or a shop girl or as a seamstress, and often she was banished from her family and from community. So at this time, as you all know, women still couldn't vote, they couldn't own property, and they could be committed to an insane asylum on the say-so of a man. So countless fallen women had to resort to prostitution to make ends meet, and prostitutes lived on average about four years before they were the victims of venereal disease or violence. And as for surrendering a child for, abor for adoption, as I mentioned before, just in New York City, there are 20 to 30,000 homeless kids. So women tried anything to end their pregnancies, and they used things like turpentine, castor oil, tansy, rosemary, horseradish, ginger, Epsom salts, ammonia, quinine water and rusty nails, mustard, gin with iron filings, lavender, opium, heavy lifting, and climbing trees. And up until the 1900s, Jewish women on Manhattan's Lower East Side, they attempted to abort by sitting over a pot of hot stewed onions. So what they, had, what they thought that was gonna do, I have no idea. So as we all know, women either alone or with the help of other women, they tried to abort pregnancy since time began. And women's diaries and letters from that time, they indicate that during the 19th century, abortion was actually very common and actually is considered very safe. In the 1870s, the New York Times said that there were 20, I'm not 20, 200 full-time abortionists in New York City alone. And up until about 1800, abortion was allowed under common law and was widely practiced. It was only illegal after quickening, same thing in the colonial era. Then in 1873, the Comstock Act was passed, making it illegal to distribute or sell um, birth control products or information in the United States. So Anthony Comstock was a zealous Congregationalist from New Canaan, Connecticut, right near us. Um, he was responsible for the federal law banning birth control in 22 states, and the strictest laws were in Connecticut and Massachusetts. And we just stuck up the Connecticut statute since we're from Connecticut, which I will read. So the supposed reason was that using birth control was sinful, but the ulterior motive for all of this was that the United States had a large growing population of large of Yankee stock for all the work that was set to be had, and some feared that Yankee stock would be watered down if the poor and immigrants um, and whites, so they, you know, this reason for it, and by using birth control, 
women were rebelling against their primary social duty, which of course was motherhood. So in response, the birth control industry invented the term feminine hygiene to advertise their repackaged over-the-counter products. So these devices had kind of like code names. There are things like feminine hygiene, female wash, female tonic, female remedies, female pills, prevention powders, regulators, disinfectant, and my personal favorite is mother's friend. Here's just an example of a few of them. This one just cracks me up, this whirling thing. I don't know what they're supposed to have done. I think most people know when Lysol was first invented as a uh, birth control douche. These are just some other examples. And people share so many cool things with us. We have a friend who went to California and she actually saw a package of this mother's friend stuff and she said she took a photo of it for us. So today I was surprised to learn the Comstock Act is actually still on the books in a very modified form. That could be a talk on its own, but we'll forget about that for now. And move on to fashion. So I like to say that women wore, wore more layers of clothes than a five-year-old on a snow day. <laughs> and something I never thought about until I thought about, you know the Moulin Rouge and the Can Can Dancers? I was kind of thinking, what is the big deal about that? I understand why that was such a hot thing. But at this point, just like in the colonial era, women were still wearing crotchless underwear. So if you went to the Moulin Rouge and you saw Can Can Dancing, you got a pretty good free show there. And once again, Eris and I love the people that we meet, and we did a talk not too long ago in Wilbraham, Massachusetts. And when we were all done, they took us over to the museum, and they actually showed us a pair of crotchless underwear. And to me, that was like winning a lottery ticket, to see actually a pair of it, that's pretty cool. But then people ask, why was underwear crotchless? Well, the primary reason was that the heavy layers of woolen, woolen clothing back then could weigh about 40 pounds. So imagine going to a chamber pot or to an outhouse and lifting up 40 pounds of heavy clothing and pulling down your underwear at the same time. It was just kind of a monumental task that would have been too hard to do. So all women, including maids, they wore corsets and they were thought to be medically beneficial and they helped support a woman's weak body. Er Eris, what do you say? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a tightly laced corset was a sign of good character and a loose woman was one who behaved in an immoral way. So that's the origin of the expression, a loose woman. And they even have, believe it or not, maternity and nursing corsets. I thought that was interesting. So tight lacing made breathing difficult and led to fainting fits. And the fits were fashionable because they showed that a woman was delicate and needed to be looked after. And I all to say bleh in unison. <laughs> bleh. Yeah, exactly. Right, Eric, you're not alone in your thing. So, so tight corseting exerted 22 pounds of pressure on the internal organs. I was kind of trying to figure out what did that really mean. I, in my mind, I kind of think about trying to walk around with 22 pounds of dumbbells on your stomach all day long, and that's kind of what it would have been like. So corsets were worn, believe it or not, during horseback riding, and even on the hottest days. And of course, horseback riding was always side saddle, and people ask why that was. That's because a woman had to remain a chaste virgin until her wedding day, and if you rode astride, there's a good chance that you would break your hymen and no longer be a virgin. So imagine doing this in a corset in August in 40 pounds of heavy woolen clothing. I just can't believe it. So the 19th century corset eventually evolved into a life-threatening wasp waist corset. Very hard to say. It was also responsible for deformities, organ failure, and premature death. But hey, it kind of looked cool, don't you think? So men were told, don't marry a woman with a wasp waist. It indicated small and feeble vital organs, a delicate constitution, sickly offspring, and a short life. And men were told, beware of them, unless you wish your heart broken by the early death of your wife and children. So the next thing that came along was the S-curve corset. This was designed to place less emphasis on the waist by pushing women's chest forward and their butts back. And this kind of forced women to walk around looking like they were carrying hors d'oeuvre trays around on their <laughs> rear end. So corsets weren't actually made from whalebone. Everybody always says whalebone. They're actually made from baleen. So baleen, it looks like giant hairy combs that hangs down in the, in the jaws of whales. And they use that baleen to kind of sift critters from the sea when they're going to, when they do the eating. So it's springy and tough. So it's perfect for corsets. So places like Bridgeport and New Haven, they weren't just whaling harbors. They were actually the focus of a lot of uh, corset manufacturing. So between 1870 and 1901, the value of baleen dramatically increased. So whale oil, which had been used for lamps, was no longer being used. Now they were using kerosene. So what happened is whalers would go out, they would hack the baleen out of whale's jaws, and they would just throw the west of the whale back into the ocean. So I mean, that's terrible, terrible, terrible. And this has nothing to do with anything, but people always ask me this. Bras were invented until about the 1920s. This is what an early bra would have looked like. 
So women grew their hair long, and they only cut it short in times of illness because they believe having short hair would really help you get better. And they never, ever, ever wore their hair down in public. And every evening, women combed their hair, and they kept the loose strands in a hair receiver. And they made this hair into fake pieces that they kind of shoved into their hair juice to kind of poof them out a little bit. And I always say these things either remind me of kibasi or poop, don't they? <laughs> so as women grew older, they kept the hairstyles of their youth and they didn't update them. So I always say, can you imagine wearing the hairstyle of your youth if you were sitting here today? Like, I had some, I had some doozies also. And a 16-year-old girl, um, she was considered, considered a woman when she was 16 and she pinned her hair up for the first time and then her hair would stay up. So in the 1850s, skirts grew wider and brighter with every year, and they wore up to 12 layers of petticoats, which were often uh, stiffened with horse hair. In 1851, we saw the invention of bloomers by Amelia Jenks Bloomer. She was an editor of a New York newspaper, and it was a flop because women and bloomers were accused of wearing the trousers or trying to control their husbands. In 1856 came the invention of the crinoline, which was a set of light steel hoops, and women welcomed the lightness of this and all classes took to wearing them, including some three-year-old kids. So because of crinolines, hoop sizes or dress sizes kept getting grower, wider and wider until they're sometimes six feet wide. And two women couldn't fit through a doorway at the same time. Men couldn't offer ladies their arms when they were in the street. I find this funny, but it's not. But apparently some men, some men fell into the street and they were hit by carriages. <laughs> and this next one's not funny. Uh, very often women set fire to themselves when they walked too close to an open flame. So instead of making the hoop grow larger, uh, fashion made it go to the back, and we saw the invention of the bustle. So a woman could keep her full skirts and be aer aerodynamic and graceful, and bustles were considered a very, very sexy, modern thing. And I like this quotation from Thoreau. He said, every generation laughs at the old fashions, but follows re religiously the new. So we laugh at corsets and bustles, but I wonder how long it's going to be before we start laughing about ripped designer jeans and hug boots. Not too long at all. So prior to the 1840s, uh, wedding dresses could be any color really one of them to be, but when Queen Victoria married in 1840, she wore a white satin dress, and that kind of was a color linked with purity, and it set the stage for all future brides. And she wore orange blossoms in her veil or in her hair, so that was a very popular thing during the Gilded Age. Bathing suits weren't called bathing suits, they were called bathing costumes and they were made of thick serge, and they covered as much of the body as possible. And I think you all know serge is that stuff they use in heavy military coats today. So it didn't matter that it was heavy and hard to swim in, because women just kind of walked in the water and waded around. And actually, people didn't really learn to swim or start swimming until the 1900s. And I think you're probably all familiar with the bathing machines. Are you familiar with this? Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Okay, so the idea here was you entered the bathing machine in your regular street clothes, then you would put on your bathing costume, then they wheeled this thing out into the water, and you made your entrance right into the water that way. That was really, a real popular thing in Newport. So moving on to beauty. So if we think being thin is important now, it's nothing compared to the way how it was back in the Gilded Age. So I like this quotation. It is better by far to be the butt of jokes concerning walking shoestrings or perambulating umbrella cases than to waddle through life burdened with an excessive amount of flesh. The thin sister can pat out the angles, put frills and puppy things over the bony places, but alas for the fat ones. <laughs> I kind of like that. So women use patent medicines to uh, lose weight. They use arsenic, strychnine, and tapeworm larva in pills. So the idea here was that the worm grew inside your digestive, digestive, what I say, digestive tract until it grew up to about 30 feet long, and then you ate another, another, or ate a portion of your calories. And then you took another pill to kill the tapeworm, and then squatting over a chamber pot or in an outhouse, you held up your 40 pounds of clothing and you pulled out the 30, pound, 30 feet of dead tapeworm with your bare hands. So yeah, it was bad. They also thought it was important to make sure your bosom was bouncy, pert, and plump. And I like this quotation, I don't really get it. The highest, best type of bosom is not only placed well up on the chest, but can best be described as slightly pineapple form. So I still don't understand what that was all about. I don't get that. So wrinkles were like a big, big deal, and women were told to always sleep with something perishable on your face. So they used sheep's wool, soaked in sheep fat, on their faces at night. They used thin slices of raw beef. 
They use spermaceti, which is like the gooey wax insert inside a sperm whale's head. And sailors first, first thought this stuff was actually sperms. So that's, why, that's why they're called sperm whales. They put lard on their faces, or they put slices of veal on their faces. So nightshade, I think you all know, it's one of the most poisonous plants in the world, and it causes the pupils of the eyes to dilate and become larger. So women believe that large pupils were a really sexy look, so very often at night they would place nightshade drops in their eyes before going out at night. And the décolleté was often exposed in evening gowns, and women sometimes painted, painted fine blue lines on the skin to increase the appearance of those translucent veins. Now this next I'm going to tell you, it's undocumented, but I saw it in a minimum of four different places that women really liked the beauty that was caused by tuberculosis. They really liked the pale skin, the thin waist, and the red lips and cheeks. And apparently, from what I read, it became a trend for women to try and contract tuberculosis so they would have that look. Yeah, undocumented, but easily, easily. I saw it in four different places that I, that I hunted around. So moving on to mourning. So I think we all know when Prince Albert died of typhoid in 1861, Victoria became a widow with nine kids, I think it was age 42. So her royal uh, servants wore black armbands for nine years, and for 39 years, Victoria only wore white, lilac, and black, and she had her clothes, Albert's clothes set out every day. So Victoria's mourning was excessive. Women followed very, very strict and complicated mourning rules. It was simple for men, they just wore a black armband over their suits. So widows had to wear different clothes for the four different stages of mourning. We tried to summarize this because it was so, so complicated. So the first one was first or deep mourning. So widows wear a plain black dress covered with crepe, which kind of like a dull, kind of crinkly black silk. And when they went out, they hid their faces behind a full veil. So after a year and a day, and you have to keep track of all this, widows moved to second mourning, so they can now wear the veil back and show their faces. Nine months later, once again, you're keeping track of all this, they reached the third stage, which is ordinary mourning, and they stopped wearing the black crepe. They replaced it with shiny black silk, trimmed with ribbons and jet. And jet jewelry is just um, black stone made from pieces, fossilized pieces of the monkey puzzle tree. If you wondered about that. And actually, it's a very good protective stone. Eris wears it all the time. Yeah, you're into stones. Yeah, right. Um, so the last stage is called half mourning. It lasted for six months, and they could wear soft colors like lilac and gray. And at weddings throughout the entire process, you could wear half mourning so you weren't this gloomy figure that was hanging around at a wedding. They had really, really strict mourning rules for almost anyone you could think of. That with the books I was looking at, they kept these sheets kind of like folded out, almost like looking at an Excel spreadsheet. Because they had mourning rules for aunts and uncles, for second cousins, for sisters-in-law, for your stepmother's sisters. It was very, very, very complicated. So a widower could remarry at any time throughout the process, and on his wedding day, he could take off his black armband. But he had to put the armband back on the next day, and his new wife had to go into mourning for the dead wife. <laughs> yeah, can you believe it? Whatever, whatever the point was. So observing mourning was very expensive because as fashions changed, mourning clothes were also supposed to change. And um, they also they did that having crepe hanging around your, your house was a very unsafe thing to do. So this really intense mourning practice, that ended in 1901 when Victoria died. So moving on to death. So the Gilded Age is probably most famous for its post-mortem photography. Just to warn you ahead of time, some of these photos are like pretty horrible to look at, but they're also interesting. So having photos taken was still considered very expensive. and. Um, out of reach for most people, but when a loved one died, people rummaged up enough money to have a funeral portrait taken. So the earliest <coughs> portraits are very simple, they'd just be the person in the casket, they would display this photo in a parlor, and it was a form of me memento mori, which was a Latin expression of the day, it just meant remember that you have to die. So here's where the photos get bad. So there was something called hidden mother pictures. These were pictures taken because the mother didn't want to be seen, so she hid behind something and she held the dead baby in her arms. I know, these are really bad. So eventually, Photoshop-like touches were added after the picture was developed, and they painted on things like rosy cheeks and rosy lips, and open eyes were painted on the photo negative. So these are all um, dead people with photo not painted on there. Uh, I have trouble looking at these. So to make the dead person look like they were standing, they had special stands constructed. They were disguised by curtains or by the body of the person itself. Childhood death rates were very high, and sadly the only photo taken of an entire family might be one with the youngest in a coffin. Sometimes living siblings were made to pose alongside their dead brothers and sisters, and the portrait would then be displayed in the parlor of the home. 
The deceased were posed with some of their favorite items. So young girls would be photographed with dolls, and adults would be with things like uh, books or letters or flowers. And some photos had multiple generations of deceased people in them. So like this photo is a good example of that. The father looks alive, but you look at his stiff hands and his vacant stare, you can see that he's not alive, and in these following photos too. So at this point, embalming had been around for centuries, but truly effective modern embalming hadn't been invented yet, and they were still preserving bodies with arsenic. So this is the whole reason that flowers came to be associated with funerals. So fresh, flower, fresh flowers are needed to mask the odor of a decomposing, bo be decomposing, it's hard to say, decomposing body in your living room. And they covered all the mirrors and shiny objects in the house with black crepe fabric because they believed the dead could be caught in these mirrors or these shiny objects, get trapped there, and then beckon living members into the afterlife with them. They thought the dead person had to leave the house head first because they removed, if they removed them feet first, they beckoned family members to join them in the afterlife. And they had something called kind of an over-the-top practice. They had these things called tear vials or lacrimatories. And they were there, kind of like a test tube with a cork on the top. And what would happen was they would hand these out before the funeral. Then mourners would help have these throughout the funeral. They would cry into them. Then they present them to the family afterwards, show the depth of their mourning. So kind of an interesting one. So moving into my conclusion, just as all women in 2019 don't get butt implants or placenta facials, not all Gilded Age women ate tapeworm larvae or wore meat masks to bed. So my great-grandmother, May Proven McWilliams, who I never met, um, she didn't have time to draw fine blue lines on her decollete because she was busy raising seven kids and she died at age 41. But she raised a daughter, my grandmother, who I never met, who was a flapper, she drove a car, and she divorced her husband. And it's because of all those women who came before us that were sitting here today in pants we have reliable birth control options and menstrual care products. And just like I talked about in my other talk, I think perhaps women need to remind how far we've come in order to still see how far we can go. So even though we uh, laugh at a lot of these Gilded Age practices, I can tell just by doing my presentations that a lot of people are still very uncomfortable hearing about these topics. Um, you just take a look at the feminine hygiene aisle in grocery stores, and it's easy to see that. Yeah. And the products have names like Carefree, Summer's Eve, Always, Stay Free, Vagisil, Barely There, Odor Blocking Feminine Wash. So wouldn't you love to see pad and tampon manufacturers dump those pearly pink and, pearl and purple <laughs> color schemes because periods aren't pink or purple, periods are red. And the term feminine hygiene implies there's something inherently dirty and shameful about menstruation. Why can't we just call them period products or menstrual products? So as we sit here this afternoon, this blew my mind, more than 800 million women worldwide are having a period, right, like this very second. At the 2016 Olympics in Rio, there were Chinese sports fans who didn't know it was possible for women to swim when they had their period. Not like they might bleed in the pool, they thought you were incapable of swimming while you had your period. And to this day, advertisers still use that mysterious blue liquid to demonstrate the absorbency of pads and, and diapers and tampons. So menstrual blood is still referred to as fluid or flow because blood is fine in horror films, but not when it's coming out of your vagina. So in Japan, today, still, Shinto women are still barred from temples during menstruation, and they're not allowed to climb certain sacred mountains. And it wasn't until 1969, 69, the year that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, that they finally put that adhesive strip in patch and it'll stick it to your underwear. 1969. The United States, 39, I think, I think just changed them. Three, well, we'll say 39. 39 states still have a tax on tampons and pads because they're considered a luxury item. And California generates $20 million a year on menstruating women. Connecticut, we just repealed our tax in July 2018. I think Rhode Island might be next on the list. In 2014, the United Nations declared May 28th as Menstrual Hygiene Day. Like, what's up with the hygiene? Why didn't we call that? So even though we're now more comfortable physically during menstruation and, and uh, using birth control, I think people still are very uncomfortable talking about this. And I just ask, I want you once in a while just to think about our foremothers, whatever ever the generation, and on your way out to the parking lot, don't let your womb wander. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my presentation. <laughs> so sometimes people like to hear what else we have going on. So this is my daughter, Eris. Eris Yerba, so she's going to talk a sec. Well, what else we have going on? Hi. Hello. 
So, I'm Eris, as you've heard. So my mom is kind of known as the colonial good wife because of her talk, the not so good life of the colonial good wife. And I own Granite Holistic Wellness. I'm an herbalist and holistic nutritionist. I work with flower essences. So we used to always do things separately, um, and then we decided that we should start teaching classes together and doing things together. So now with both of our businesses, we've combined into Grounded Good Wife. We teach a bunch of hands-on holistic workshops and also gal power presentations. We're always popping up somewhere. Um, we're actually quite a lot in um, Long Island, on Long Island. So if you check out our website, you'll see where we're going to be. And we teach all over the place. So. Then this is showing that at our house in Woodbury, we're always knocking down walls and ripping up floors and finding cool stuff. We never really know what we're going to find, but it's always a surprise. So like behind here, we thought there was going to be a um, chimney, no, a fireplace, and we ended up finding a chimney, so it's always, we never know what's going to be there, and it's always cool. So with our book coming out, we're hosting, uh, we have a lot of book clubs scheduled to come and get a tour of our house and meet us. In, it's about pretty far from here, but if you happen to be around. It. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, you made a brief mention of the paranormal, or do you have ghosts in your house? I mean, yes, we, we do. Okay. I used to be so embarrassed to talk about this because people are either really into paranormal or they think that you're a total whack job. So only recently do I feel kind of comfortable talking about this. But yes, we, here's, here's what I, I never really thought about this paranormal stuff. But I've always believed that everything is comprised of energy, and energy can't be created or destroyed. So my feeling is, why can't there be, I mean, our house is, what, almost 300 years old? Why can't there be, you know, spirits around? So yes, we've had paranormal investigations. They really have found documented stuff. We nothing bad, only good energy. Um, in Eris's apothecary, the people that have come over, they believe that Eris has a vortex in her, in her apothecary. And a vortex is simply just a door. And you know how when you open your door, like 99% of the time there's somebody nice there? And that's so a vortex is where kind of spirits come and go. And they also believe that our house was built on a ley line, you know, kind of like Stonehenge, and that's yeah. why we have so much activity in our house. But only good stuff. Everybody comes in the house, there's such good energy in the house, and that's one of the reasons why we bought it. As soon as we walked in, we just love the energy in the house. So, so yes. Interesting. Yes, it's pretty cool. No, no, we're all over the place. We were just in New York yesterday. We're in Massachusetts tomorrow. We're we're all over the place. Yeah, we're yeah, we're all over. Yeah. Any other questions? I know it's a lot to throw at you. Yes. You said you're from Woodbury. I'm familiar with Woodbury. Did you ever meet Rob, Rob Zombie? No. No, no, no. no we, he's around. No, no, we haven't. <laughs> yeah, Woodbury's in Litchfield County. We're over by like Southbury, Litchfield, Bethlehem. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. I was wondering if the spirit of uh, not knowing anything about science, mm -hmm. was, if, if they're more primal in Newport than they are in some tribes in Samoa, like Maldives. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, no one's ever. Oh. I was wondering how it is, it sounds as if Europe was similar, the uh, laws of inheritance and everything, England. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how the rest of the world, I think, may have been uh, more attuned to nature. I, I would, what do you think, Eris? This is more your, your field than mine. Um, you mean about spirits or about? No, I'm sorry, about uh, knowing about their bodies and oh, okay. Um, I don't really, I don't really get, like, you're not really asking me a question, you're just sort of like no, thinking asking, aloud. I'm asking, do you think uh, Newport was as primitive as we, suggest mm -hmm. other parts of the world were. That's a good question. I don't know. What do you what's everybody else think? Yes. As primitive? I I would kind of think yeah I would kind of think yes based on yeah. I can't think of anything specific but based on the research that we're doing, I think so too. And right now we're doing research. Our next one's gonna be about the not so queenly life of the Tudor wife. <laughs> so I mean we're kinda of, yeah we've kinda of gone pretty far back and you know so yeah I think Newport was. I don't think that they yeah I think you're right. Um, I think a lot of the stuff didn't necessarily apply to all women. Women were in farm communities, but there again, when you do a talk, you have to kind of, you know, this talk could have been six hours long. It kind of was at the very beginning, so we had to kind of shrink it down. But a lot of these farm women, I'm sure farm women were not taking tapeworm pills, you know, <laughs> or putting deadly nightshade in their eyes. But um, but we had to kind of get the most that we could in for the whole talk. But yes, and yes. I think I read um, that it said that if you use people using birth control could be fined or imprisoned. Yes. <laughs> Who was fined? The men or the women? We're being fine, women. Women, women. yes, okay. yes, yes. And the women would be in prison? Yeah, yeah, apparently. 
You know what someone told me? We just did this talk in Rutgers a couple days ago, and someone told us that Franklin Roosevelt didn't know anything about condoms. He didn't know any condoms existed. And the reason they had the five, they had the five kids, and then you know he had the affair, and she stopped having sex with him. But what was my point of my story? Oh, that Franklin Roosevelt, an educated guy, didn't know that condoms existed. Which I mean, that wasn't that long ago. You know, none of this stuff was that long ago. Yes. You may not have wanted to know because I heard that he thought women to main job was to preach. And that was the thinking back then. Yeah, that's why a lot of people ask us, "What do you think would be better, to be a colonial woman or to be a Victorian woman?" And I think colonial women, although they had a hard, hard life, I think it was more like men and women were kind of in it together. And I think Victorian women, they were just treated, not all, but the wealthier ones, they were just more treated like these, you know, bubbleheads who only the purpose was to have babies and to be, you know, productive. And once you were no longer fertile, you really had no use. So I think if I had to live, I think, we've talked about this a lot in the car, I think I'd rather be a colonial woman um, because I don't think things changed all that much. But the thinking of it, being in, being in it together, that really kind of changed in that period. But, any other questions? Oh, well, thank you for coming. Hope we didn't offend anybody or shock anybody. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia, so much. We'd love to have you back and talking about another related subject at some point. But thank you so much for coming today. Thank you all for coming. We don't want this ever sound like a